This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Nier Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or simply people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is an Israel studies professor at the University of Oklahoma, and among his numerous and diverse research interests is the political history of the Baha'i community in 20th century Israel, especially its relationship with the Zionist leadership and later the Israeli authorities. D. Gershon Leventhal, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Thank you. So by way of introduction, let's uh, start with a general question. Who are the Baha'i? And how and when did they end up in the Holy Land? It's a great entryway. Uh, the Baha'is developed out of Shi Islam in Iran in the middle of the 19th century. It's a sort of, to make a strange comparison, it's sort of like the relationship between Christianity to Judaism. Uh, the Baha'is see themselves as the completion of Shi Islam, that the promised Messiah uh, who is uh, foretold to come at the end of times, he comes in the middle of the 19th century, Uh, he's seen as a liberating figure who uh, revokes Islamic law. He creates a new religion, and this new religion is first called the Bobby faith. It's a figure named, known as the Bob, who precedes the Bob, B-O-B. the Bob, B-A-B, B-A-B. Uh, the okay. gate. Uh, he's called the, he initially, he declares himself to be the gate to the hidden imam. The imam is the Messiah. And after a couple of years, or after a short while of time, he declares himself actually to be the hidden imam himself, so the Messiah, the promised uh, figure. And he leads uh, actually a, a, what we might even describe a social revolt in Iran that, that engulfs the whole country, perhaps as many as 40 percent of the population of Iran even uh, began to follow him. Um, but he was uh, executed by the state. And thereafter, he, shortly before his death, he promised that there would be someone even greater than him who would succeed him. And that is Baha'u'llah. And that is Baha'u'llah, who was first imprisoned immediately after the execution of the Bab. And in prison, he has a vision that he is this foretold uh, individual. And he begins to operate slowly. He, he's forced out of Iran. He settles in uh, outside of Baghdad in Iraq. And there, in 1863, he declares himself to his close followers that he is this, uh, he whom God will make manifest. And thereafter, he's continually pushed further and further away from Iran because the Iranians are very fearful that he is going to rile up the population. But he's quite different from his predecessor because he believes very much in pacifism. He rejects political activity. And both these movements were very unique for their emphasis on equality, mm. uh, social, uh, gender, uh, racial egalitarianism and radical, even in terms of social justice and inequality, economic inequality. Uh, eventually makes his way to the area around Istanbul, to Idirne first, and then to Istanbul. And then the Ottomans are not sure what to do with him because he and his brother are competing. His brother sees himself as the rightful leader. He's jealous of Baha'u'llah, uh, who is much more charismatic and much more successful and also seems to be much more authentic. And so the competition between these two brothers leads the Ottomans to decide we want to get rid of both of these. We're going to send them both to prisons and get them as far away as we can from the center of the Ottoman Empire. So they send one, the younger brother, to uh, Cyprus, to Famagusta, and they send Bahá'u'lláh to Akko, which was seen as a kind of prison backwater town of the Ottoman Empire. And for the Baha'is, this is uh, another one of the many examples that they see of the Baha'i faith as being divinely guided. That here is someone who started off in Iran, and he ends up in the Holy Land, and the land where all of the major religions were born and took form. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly where the point of my departure takes place, because I say to myself, Well, the Baha'is focus so much on the history of the Baha'i faith, on how uh, the Baha'i faith has developed, how it's spread around the world, how it's become the fastest growing religion per capita in the world, how um, there's millions of Baha'i believers in almost every country in the world. And yet there's very little attention focused to the development of the faith itself, the community of believers in uh, Ottoman Palestine, British Mandatory Palestine, and then the state of Israel. All right. So Baha'u'llah is being sent to prison in Acre, like uh, many other uh Illustrious historical figures. Exactly. And then he comes out and what? So he's actually in prison almost until the very end of his life in Akko. 
uh, at the towards the end of his life, he is given more freedoms uh, and he's basically allowed to live uh, more or less unmolested. But he he lives and dies in Akko. But before he dies, he tells his son Abdul Baha says uh, across the bay I can see there this mountain Mar Carmel and uh, there's an area that I always see from my prison cell and that's the place where I want you to build a shrine to the Bab, the messenger who preceded me and also that should be the administrative headquarters of the faith. Um, but he himself is buried in a mansion north of Akko at the time it was north of Akko today it's still it's within the bounds of the city of Akko called Bahji. It's a beautiful mansion. Many Israelis visit the Baha'i terraces and shrines in, in Haifa, and it's the most visited, perhaps, tourist site in Israel. But uh, very few make it out to Bahji, which is, it's not uh, vertical, it's uh, horizontal, but right. it's equally impressive of a garden and uh, quite a majestic place, really, to visit, especially in the early morning hours when one can actually go inside of Bahji and into the room in which uh, Baha'u'llah passed away. So Baha'u'llah saw his arrival in Israel as some sort of divine calling. He, he, he saw... Uh, his religion as belonging in the Holy Land. It he, wasn't just a coincidence. It was not. It was the hand of God that had brought him here. Mm-hmm. And he repeatedly emphasized this, that this is a part of the passage that prophets make, that messengers make. And all the time that he was persecuted, first by the Iranians and then other uh, regimes along the way, and the Ottomans, where were his followers? So the bulk of his followers started out in Iran. He was, of course, Iranian, and he was uh, born a Shi, and all of his followers were born Shi's, uh, at least in the early stages. But as he made his way, he gathered around him many people who turned to him, even within the Ottoman Empire, initially Shi's in Iraq, but then even other people. In Akko, for example, a large number of, uh, I don't want to exaggerate it, and I'm not talking about tens of the percentage, but, you know, indiv- large numbers of individuals turned to Bahá'u'lláh were very impressed by this figure. He really seems to have been very charismatic. Uh, even Western observers, the famous Cambridge historian Edward Brown, visited him and was really quite taken with him. He writes uh, an account of his meeting with Baha'u'llah and he describes him as a very magical figure almost. This is someone who who could captivate individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, the faith though initially, and this is what's so interesting, is it's still majority by the time that Baha'u'llah dies in 1892 comprised of Iranians, Iranian Shi born. I'm I'm not calling them Shis anymore. And there's even a question if I look at it as a scholar looking at the faith's history and not, uh, I'm not a Baha'i believer myself, it's even we might even raise some questions as to how independent the Baha'i religion or faith or movement was from Shi Islam at that point. Mm. Gradually, it is separated entirely. But at this point, there's still some question marks. And his son, for example, continues to attend mosque from time to time. He doesn't see himself exactly as a Muslim, but we might even see that the Baha'i faith is more like a reform movement within Islam. Uh, And really, again, here I draw the parallel to Christianity versus Judaism. It takes some time for the two religions to completely separate. Mm -hmm. So upon Baha'u'llah's death, and that's when the centers in Akko and Haifa become the international centers of the Baha'i movement, that's around the same time as Zionism starts uh, inhabiting uh, the land. Uh, What can you tell us about the geopolitical situation at the time when that happened and how the Baha'i contingent in Palestine react to that? So what's really interesting is when the Baha'is first come to Palestine in the 1860s, 1867, if I'm not mistaken, it's also the same year that the German Templars come. And the German Templars are coming because they believe that uh, Jesus is going to return imminently. Of course, for the Baha'is, they say, well, here he is. He's he's Baha'u'llah, is is the living embodiment of Jesus. Uh, But this is for them one of the first uh, also kind of confirmations from outside, that there is some sort of movement of people that are coming to fulfill some sort of promised prophecy, and here being uh, the prophecy of the return of Jesus. But with the rise of Zionism, here's another example. The ingathering of the Jews becomes another confirmation of the message and the prophecy and the, and the truthfulness of Baha'u'llah, which is to say that God promised that he would gather the Jews together. And Abdul Baha wrote about this. He said that the, the movement of the Jews to return to the land of Israel is a sort of confirmation of the Baha'i faith. And so there isn't... Initially, I thought to myself, well, maybe we'll see some sort of tensions or conflict because they're both competing for land in the Haifa area. Both of them are trying to acquire land, especially during the period of Abdul Baha and his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, who becomes the guardian of the faith in the early 1920s. And yet we don't see this. Uh, the closest example I could ever find, which isn't even an example, is Shoghi Effendi writing a letter to his believers saying, you know, I've heard rumors that uh, Jews might be interested in creating a national cemetery on Mount Carmel, but I'd like to purchase more of this land to expand the Shrine of the Bab, and maybe we should raise money for that. As we know, there was never a national cemetery that emerged there. Another interesting uh, historical fact that I discovered thanks to uh, reading your work is that uh, the Baha'i sold the Zionists, the land that later became the first kibbutzim, the Ganya yes, and uh, Kinnaret. 
because the Baha'is initially, in the early stages, they settled throughout the country. Uh, the, the British uh, censuses uh, that they took, first one, I think, I think was in 1922, uh, they show Baha'is living throughout the country, even in Beersheba. How many people are we talking about, roughly? In the very early stages, we're talking about a couple hundreds, and then this grows gradually over mm. time. So there were, uh, all along, there were a negligible minority? Well, it depends. If we're talking about just the city of Haifa, by the British uh, period, by 1930s, for example, there are a significant uh, small percentage of the city. Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was something like 10% of the population of the city. Uh, so it's not entirely negligible. As a part of the country of a whole, yes, we're talking mm. about at their height, uh, f- but, a few thousand. But as you said, they had no political aspirations. They had no, because of course, in, in fact, Baha'is believe that it is forbidden to engage in political activity and campaigning, electioneering. And so Baha'is abstain from political activity. They believe in allegiance to whoever is the powers that be. And in this sense, uh, they try to find a modus operandi with wherever, wherever they happen to be living. Mm. In so, the, under the British mandate, what was the nature of their relationship with the authorities, with the British so authorities? They had a very good relationship uh, with the CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress that came to power, the Young Turk Revolution that brought to power this uh, political movement at the end of the Ottoman Empire that eventually took charge and led the Ottoman Empire into the First World War. Uh, they had a very bad relationship. Uh, Jamal Pasha, who was in charge of Palestine, he did not treat much of the population very well. And that, that, that's the minorities and majorities alike. Mm-hmm. And in particularly the Baha'is. But, but also uh, because of, for religious reasons, they, just like in Iran, they saw the Baha'is as some sort of a threat. The Committee of Union and Progress wasn't too strong on, I mean, they did make use of some religious motifs, but they weren't too strong about the Baha'is. They didn't really have too much interest in the Baha'is because many of them were also, they shared many of the intellectual aspirations that the Baha'is had. But they, what they did not like in Palestine were minorities right. um, that were challenging and that were a potential kind of threat to to the stability of the Ottoman Empire, especially during the First World War. And for this reason, they expel, for example, the, the, much of the Jewish community in Palestine. Um, this is perhaps one of the most devastating events to befall the Jewish community, the Jewish Yeshuv period. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. tens of thousands of people died. It's actually something that uh, demands more interest and in, in exploration if there's someone here listening, a young uh, graduate student might look into this. Uh, but the Baha'is themselves are in fear of uh, what might happen to them as well. And Jamal Pasha supposedly even decided to assassinate Abdul Baha, the leader of the community. Nevertheless, Abdul Baha himself uh, realized which way the winds were turning. And he was very willing to work together with the British once the British had arrived. In fact, he had gained through some of these Baha'i agricultural settlements throughout the country in what today is the Golan or the Jordan Valley in the south. He had uh, some grain storages, and this was a period of, of famine. And he decided to open up his storages and to disseminate it amongst the population. So the British actually viewed this so favorably that they actually knighted Abdul Baha shortly afterwards. And so you can see that this is really an indication of the esteem that they held him in. Mm-hmm. And uh, and certainly thereafter, the relationships were very good between the leadership of the Baha'i faith and the British. Once Abdul Baha died a year later, in 1922, his grandson who took over the faith had been educated in the UK. Uh, so he himself saw himself as a product in some respects of a Western intellectual atmosphere and, and felt very at home. And the British did too? I mean, they, they looked at uh, the, the young man and said to themselves, is one of ours? I mean, I can't obviously get into the minds of the British, uh, but it stands to reason that they they certainly realized that they could work together with him, that this was, to use the terminology of the time, he was an Oriental notable with whom they could deal. Uh, And this is certainly the way that they saw him. He was responsible for several thousand believers in Palestine, and not to mention spread around already in the Middle East and beginning to be even in North America and Europe and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They realize this is someone who has some sort of influence and is actually willing to work with us. I doesn't mean, and and I want to emphasize, I'm not trying to apply there's some sort of political collaboration going on. I'm talking about simple, you know, day-to-day coordination. Yeah. He's, so, he's so that actually brings me to my next question. What was the, how did the Baha'i interact with the other population groups in the country? And again, what were their uh, socioeconomic characteristics? So generally, the Baha'is were trying to emphasize, put, uh, deed, put word to deed. In other words, they believe in the equality of faith, so their, their point is to always show, and this continues today, that they accept all religions, that they have no hostility, that they have no um, racism or animosity towards other faiths and ethnicities. And this certainly is the way that they operated during this period as well, trying to reach out to the other communities to serve as a kind of uh, bridge between the different communities of Haifa and Akko. As far as the socioeconomic status, a large number of them were well off, but then there were also ones that were not. I mean, it's uh, just like the rest of the population. We have the haves and the have-nots. 
um, a large number of the followers of Baha'u'llah who had kind of made their way trickling from Iran and from Iraq into Palestine over these years and, and continuing during this period. Some of them came penniless uh, and settled in, in the area. Some uh, individuals in the area converted. Uh, we're talking about ethnically Arab, uh, Palestinian Arabs who converted, uh, who adopted the faith, and they came with whatever status that they had. I mean, becoming a Baha'i did not, of course, mean that you suddenly become uh, uh, wealthy or something like that. Mm, no, but sure, uh, some population groups are more predisposed to uh, be attracted to certain religions according to their cultural atmosphere. In Palestine, we don't have too much information about conversion because this isn't really a goal of the Baha'is. In fact, it's actually, certainly today, it's forbidden uh, for Baha'is to proselytize. They, they forbid themselves. I'm not implying this is from an outside. They forbid themselves to proselytize. During that period, the, there wasn't a firm ruling and again, I'm speaking here as an academic, I'm sure that there would be Baha'is who will say, no, there is a, a ruling that Baha'u'llah indicated that you can't convert and you can't proselytize in the Holy Land. But uh, we don't always find that this is entirely followed during this period because we do have conversions that are taking place. But on the whole, what we do see is a gradual different trend that's taking place within the Baha'i community. And that is that in each generation, there are challenges to the leadership of the faith from within the rest of the Baha'i leadership. Usually, and it's a very strange phenomenon. I mean, we always see this in many religious and, and, and social movements that takes place, that of course that there would be challenges to leadership. But what we see here is that the leadership that does succeed is not the traditional conservative leadership. It's always the more radical one. And that's what's somewhat unusual. For example, uh, Bahá'u'lláh and his brother, to go back to them for a moment, Bahá'u'lláh was more willing to push the envelope, so to speak, as to breaking further and further away from Shi'i Islam. His brother was not. His brother saw this clearly as a reform movement within Shi'i Islam. And this came to a head when Bahá'u'lláh decided to challenge his brother to a kind of disputation, a mubahila. And uh, generally speaking, in Shi'i Islam, which has a very strong tradition of impurity, ritual impurity, if you believe that someone is so wrong and so almost like a heathen, he is impure and you don't even want to engage with him because his impurity will rub off on you. So generally speaking, in traditional Shi'i society, if you had a competition, a rivalry between these two brothers, neither one would want to show up and engage in, really engage in this disputation because their, the other's heathenness would rub off. And this is still the attitude that affected Baha'u'llah's brother. But Baha'u'llah himself didn't believe in this anymore. He'd done away with ritual impurity. And mm. so as he walked through the markets to meet his brother and everyone in the bazaar saw him walking to go and do this, and his brother never showed up, this obviously ended up uh, completely weakening his brother's position because people realized that Bahá'u'lláh was doing something different, that he really had changed things. This continues in the next generation. Abdul Baha faces a challenge from his brothers, uh, in particular one of his brothers, who believe that, you know, uh, we shouldn't be moving as far away from Islam as you are, and we should be working together with the rest of the community. And then his own grandson, Shoghif, and he faces a major challenge from his relatives who say, we need to ally ourselves with the Palestinian Arabs. We're talking about the 1920s and the 1930s and the 1940s, as the conflict between uh, Jews and Arabs in Palestine begins to take force. And they say we should be working together with this population. In fact, they begin to intermarry with uh, notable Palestinian Arab families. And Shoghi Effendi says, no, we're actually not doing this. Uh, we, we don't engage in politics. And furthermore, our focus should be on the international world. We're not sticking within the framework, the narrow frameworks of Islam and uh, Arab or Iranian society. Now we want to look at the global world, of course, himself being the product of a British uh, it, it, it upbringing. Seemed, it seemed like they were doing a lot of politics for a group that uh, avoided uh, uh, politics. But, uh, They're uh, really uh, at the nexus of many different political activities, even though they themselves, generally speaking, I'm talking about the Orthodox Baha'i believers, yeah. are not involved in, in political I want to activity. take you to uh, what you just said about uh, how they try to uh, weather the storm of the impending Jewish-Arab conflict. Basically, the Shoya Fendi's uh, refusal to ally with the Palestinians proved to be maybe the best uh, uh, gamble anyone could have ever taken. Although I don't think that in his respect, I don't think that it was such a surprising decision. Uh, because as far as he was concerned, if the Palestinian Arabs had won, he being the representative, the leader of a heterodox Muslim community. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, the first against the wall. Yeah, and so uh, for him, I don't think, uh, and, and I want to make it clear, and this is very important, that he didn't endorse Zionism, he didn't endorse the Jews in the 1948 war when the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine uh, requested a statement from him. His statement was actually, I'm not giving a statement. Even though, even within that statement, we can find that there are some hints of his own uh, sympathies towards the Jewish cause, but that's my reading. I'm not. I'm not. He was very clear to emphasize that he doesn't want to give a statement because he 
he doesn't want to get involved. But certainly his wife in her memoirs recorded the fear that they had, that if the Arabs won, that they may have destroyed the faith entirely, mm-hmm. or at least the leadership and, and the headquarters of the faith in, in Palestine. And the Zionists, after they won the war and the state of Israel was established, acknowledged him for his position. Certainly. Uh, in, in the very early stages of the war, some of the soldiers in Haganah and later in Thailand, IDF, they weren't quite in, sure what to make of the Baha'is. They didn't know who the Baha'is were. You know, When they fought in the uh, Jordan Valley and they captured uh, the area, especially uh, Engev, uh, the kibbutz of Engev today is founded on Baha'i lands. There was a couple of Baha'i settlements there. They took the Baha'is that were there and they removed them from the border because they were very close to the Jordanian and the Syrian borders. And they thought, you know, these are just regular population that are here. But these were not Arabs. These were Baha'is. They were ethnically Persian and they had nothing to do with this. Uh, Nevertheless, the Israelis were not so willing to put them back on the border. They still were hesitant about having uh, these groups on the border. But they worked out a very good deal with Shoghi Effendi where they sold him or gave him a great deal of land in the Haifa and Aqua areas in exchange for kind of trading the land that he had had in the Jordan Valley. And for him, this was a great solution. They also helped him internally uh, to settle political disputes, or what I call political disputes, but meaning disputes within his community with his relatives, to basically rule in his favor in several court cases uh, over land uh, that he believed belonged to the leadership of the faith, that belonged to the faith itself, that was being occupied during this period by some of his renegade relatives. And it's important to note that all of these relatives that I talked about, that let's say during the 30s and the 40s that got involved with the Palestinian Arab cause, they were excommunicated from the Baha'i faith. They're called covenant breakers. Mm. So even though I, I'm interested to study them as well, because I do see them as part of the larger, what I call Baha'i community. They're not technically Baha'is, they're renegade Baha'is, but still they're not quite the same as the rest of the population. So as a scholar, I'm just calling it the Baha'i community as a whole, but technically I should say the Baha'is and the former Baha'is mm. or the ex-Baha'is or something right. like that. And what about the descendants? Are they still uh, um, among this, us? This is a, a fascinating question. Uh, there is a great sociologist from Hebrew University, Eric Cohen, that studied the Baha'is in Akko in the 1970s. And uh, in particular, when he said the Baha'is in Akko, he was talking about the covenant breakers, these descendants of the renegades. And he noted that there's nothing that keeps them together anymore. There's no real ideology. They have some sort of memory of their, their past as part of this, uh, as their, their, their descendants from Baha'u'llah, and they are connected to this uh, movement, but they have no real organization. It's not really something that can keep going. And certainly there's no conversions or anything like that taking place. And he predicted that it will disappear within a couple of generations. And he was entirely correct. Uh, when we look today... There are some descendants of the Baha'is that acknowledge themselves as different from the rest of the population. Uh, we're talking mostly the very oldest surviving relatives. There is a woman who, from time to time, you see interviews with her. I, I believe actually she just passed away. I may be wrong, but I think I, I heard that she passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but she was a granddaughter, of, or great-granddaughter, I think, of uh, Baha'u'llah. And she saw herself as very different from the rest of the population. But the rest of them eventually just... D- disappeared into the Palestinian Arab society the of Palestinian Haifa and Arab society, yeah. not the Jewish one. Because they though... intermarried with them. They, mm. they were already, you know, uh, they saw themselves not so different from the Islamic milieu. And this is exactly actually what Abdul Baha and especially Shoghi Effendi were trying to emphasize during their periods as leaders of the faith, was that we need to distinguish ourselves very strongly from Islamic society or else we're going to disappear back into them. And this is why Shoghi Effendi had this great challenge with his relatives, because his relatives were trying to say, you should prefer and give precedence to Persians, to uh, Shi, to former Shis, to these people who come from our culture, and instead you're giving precedence to all these Canadians and Americans and Europeans who are converting to the Baha'i faith, and you're giving them positions of importance. And Shoghi Effendi said, well, for the faith to be successful, we need to spread around the world. This is the message of Baha'u'llah. It's not just restricted to one ethnicity, and this is anyhow going against our ideas of, of crossing boundaries and borders that they're... So he said, we need to be focused on the world as a whole. And, and in retrospect, we obviously see that he was quite correct um, because yeah, we because, see the because, success of the faith. Uh, around the world, while it was completely dilapidated, almost completely dilapidated at home. Well, that's also partly to do with Shoghi Effendi. He was actually partly responsible for yeah. uh, the destruction of the community. In fact, by, during the 1940s and then especially in the 50s and 60s, he himself began to send away the uh, members of the Baha'i community, the believing, you know, the Orthodox believers, and pioneering. He said, you are the most devout believers. You've seen and grown up in this kind of real Baha'i authentic milieu. And now I want you to be kernels of the faith, pioneering and spreading the faith around. Mm-hmm. And I was in uh, contact yeah, with... F- a, forget uh, Christianity. It's like Chab- the Chabad. It's, it's very, it's yeah. very, there's a great parallel to Chabad. Uh, the only difference is that Chabad doesn't end up uh, completely eliminating their uh, community in Crown Heights. Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> but, but Quite this the is, contrary. This is what yeah. uh, Shoghi Fen essentially does, is, is with, with the exception of today maybe 
800, 6 to 800, what they consider themselves to be temporary residents who are working and administering the Baha'i faith in Haifa and in Akko, uh, there is no official Baha'i community in Israel anymore. Even uh, though Israel was the first country in the world to recognize the Baha'i as an official exactly, religion. Exactly. And, and to give recognition for Baha'i marriage and, and, and all of this and still on the books. And, and so Baha'is are considered to be a separate religion in Israel. It's one of the only examples in the entire world. But, uh, but there is no much more community to speak of today. Yeah, but they left uh, beautiful gardens behind, which uh, are definitely well, worth a visit. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, uh, dear Gershon Leventhal, I'm afraid this is all we have time for. But uh, thank you very much for coming in today. You're an Israel Studies professor at the University of Oklahoma. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. And also big thanks to Alex Benish, our trusted sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute for the generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. <laughs> Thank you.